something peculiar is happening right now. I am at my daughter's house. And the reason is that the electricity is off uh, at my home. And so we could not um, oh broadcast or we don't have any lights or um, refrigeration or, or heat. And so we're at my daughter's house. So I brought my computer with me to have That's this. So nice that you made such an effort. Thank you. We're having a terrible storm here in Sacramento. It's a um, it's a snowstorm. Yes, yeah, snow. Well, we don't get snow, but in the mountains close to us, we do. We're having uh, six to ten feet of snow coming down, and uh, ten to eleven inches of rain and flooding and mudslides, and um, we're in bad shape. Well, I mean, oh we're in goodness. good shape water, but we're in bad shape because of the effect. Hello, everybody coming in. We're just getting a weather report from Art here. <laughs> oh, okay. What's the weather report? Well, Ben, I, I'm at Maria's house because we don't have any electricity at our house. Oh, my goodness. What's going on? Well, um, I don't know. There's been an equipment failure, and it won't be on again until 10 o'clock tonight. So we're at Maria's, and uh, so I brought my computer with me to do this show. Aren't you a good person? Thank you. I thanked him already. Yes, he is a good person. So thank you for coming too. Hello, Emily. Nice to see you. Hello, Harry. Always nice to see you as well. You're not getting snow where you are, are you yet or not? Or no, not exactly where I am, but uh, we had a snow day so at school. So I teach in Amador County and they have a blizzard warning there. Where are you? I'm uh, in... Bear Oaks outside of Sacramento. Oh, oh, well, yes, I know about that. I'm in Granite Bay. Oh, you're not too far. So you have no power? No, no, we're out of power. I'm sorry uh, to hear that. <laughs> I didn't realize there still was such a thing as a snow day in this COVID environment. <laughs> well, it's a distance learning day. <laughs> Which school in Fair Oaks? Oh, I'm teaching in Amador, so I'm in... I own. I say, yeah, I know I own. Yeah. yeah. I know Fair Oaks. Yeah, my daughter was a teacher in San Juan District. Oh, my mom works as an attendance clerk for them. Small... Hey, welcome to everybody. We're just catching up. Finding uh, <laughs> out we live next door to each other. <laughs> welcome. Um, Where are some of the rest of you from? Go ahead, yell out, guys. Hello. Yeah, Philly, 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 Philly here. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. from Philadelphia. I, I grew up in Camden. Oh, awesome. Harry, where are you? I'm in Delaware. Yeah, Utah. Emily, you, you said to Art, but where, where are you located again in California? I'm right outside of Sacramento. Laurel, Delaware here. Home of the president, huh? That was yeah. Jennifer speaking there? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you are you must be a colleague of Harry's then. Uh, yes, I'm a colleague of Harry's through Classic Upward Bound. Okay. Oh, cool. Yes. You mentioned. Okay. And cool. Nicholas, where are you from? Welcome. You're not Nicholas, though. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. That's Jessica. Yeah. And Carrie, welcome. Thank so we'll you. wait just another minute. Um, and Nikki, where are you from? New York. <laughs> cool. New York City? Yes. Yes. Yep. I teach at Lehman City University of New York in the Bronx. You're... Chris, did you get to say where you're from? You did. I did. I put in a little Utah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Carrie's from Michigan. Is that correct? That is correct. 
And Kara, where are you from? Hi. Um, You're from I am coming from Oakland right now. I'm currently in Oakland. You're a colleague of Anna's, right? Yes, exactly. There we go. And Anna is from Berkeley as well, Berkeley High School. Welcome. <clears throat> so Art came on early and, um, and asked me how many are going to be here tonight. And I said, oh, 10, so we're, uh, we're close. Nice to see everybody. Um, I think we'll get started. And uh, as other people come, maybe I'll figure it out as we go. Um, Paul, you didn't get to say where you're from, though. Paul Hankins. From Louisville, at least the Louisville area. We're taking snow tonight, more than we expected. Mm. Okay. Marina is from Rockland County. Is that where you, how do you say where you're from? Um, close. I'm in Westchester County Westchester. in New York. Okay. Yeah. So it's like 20, I'm, I live in White Plains. It's like 25 minutes from Manhattan. Cool. Well, welcome everybody. We'll do a little more careful introductions as we go here. Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 27th of January, 2021. And um, we, uh, back in October, we messed around with uh, trying to think about creating what we were calling skills at that point. Um, I don't know, um, some of you were here then. Um, and then um, given the feedback, we had a couple of episodes like this where we met and kind of tried to make them and think about them. And then as I did more research, I found um, Art C C Costa's work and Ben. Benna. Benna Kalik's work and Art and Benna. Um, and um, they published a book back quite a while, 2008, right? Called right. Habits of Mind. And they have 16 Habits of Mind. And I thought, what if we kind of adopted their Habits of Mind? And so the point of this early conversation here is to learn more from Art and Benna about what the habits of mind are, how they've seen them over the years, and why they're kind of important right now. But we are going to quickly, we had a very brief pre-meeting, and I, but I think, Benna, you said that you like other people to ask, you know, get involved in the conversation and that's our vibe too. So be ready to look at the 16, which we'll show you the 16 um, habits of mind and tell us what you think, what, what's your, you know, you know, we'll get you involved here. But Art and Bennett, do you wanna give us some history of how this all came about and what these things are? Let's just start with the what, what is a habit of mind? So we, we put together a little PowerPoint of three or four slides because we, did? Okay. we have to, you know, we just needed to do it. But okay. before we do anything else, S. Reed, what's your first name, S. Reed? Oh, we didn't get, oh, go ahead, sorry. What's your first name? S. Reed. My first name is, is Samuel, but I go by my last name, Reed. Well, I'm Reed. Going change, I'm going to change my name in the chat. Your Reed, isn't it your birthday today? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Happy birthday! Yes, yes. Yep, yep. Thank you. Thank How you. did you know this? Oh, I can, I'm mental telepathy. I knew. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, read, I read the chat. I'm a voyeur. <laughs> well, the very cool thing that Sam does. Is that correct? Sorry, Art. Go ahead. What? Reed, you look like you're about 23. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, no, but my students keep me young. <laughs> Good for you. Then you the are 23. Really cool thing is that Sam sends birthday cards to other people. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's lovely. <laughs> well, we need to send him one. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we would all sing happy birthday to you, but have you ever heard people on this kind of oh, thing? Everybody singing at once. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mess. It's a mess. No, it, it, we've, I had my birthday cake. My students were really nice to me today. It's been a great okay. day. Great, great. Cool. Well, happy birthday. No, cool, cool. It's a good way to wrap it up with 
uh, some camaraderie. Okay, so we will. I'll share um, my yeah, screen. I, I, yes, I just made it possible. Yep. Thank you. Cool. And okay, this is who we are. <laughs> and Art, you want to talk a little bit about the history? Yeah. Um, a while back, like 1985, the Association for Supervision Curriculum Development invited me to edit a book on developing minds. And um, it was a book on really describing what is good thinking and how do you teach it. So as editor, one of the things I did was to write to people around the world who were experts in thinking skills. People like Edward de Bono from Wal Ma Malta and um, Reuven Forestein from Israel and Gabriel Solomon from Israel, David Perkins from um, Harvard and uh, Bob Sternberg from Tufts University and Bob Schwartz from University of Massachusetts. And I asked them to describe what good thinking is and what, what do good thinkers do and what do they look like and what do they sound like? And so I began receiving letters from all of these people describing from their point of view in uh, cognitive science in philosophy and in education and educational theory, uh, what, what it was that described good thinkers. So I began receiving all of these um, letters from them and descriptions. And as I was working with them, I began to see some patterns because they all said something that was some uh, that had similarities. For example, Edward de Bono talked about uh, collecting all facts before you make a decision. And Reuven Forestein talked about managing impulsivity. And uh, David Perkins and Bob Schwartz talked about resisting hasty thinking. Well, I read all those and I said, well, you know, they're, they're, they're saying quite the same thing. And what they're really saying is think before you act or think first before drawing a conclusion or make sure you have a lot of data before you make an inference, and this is one of them. And so uh, over the years, and, and by the way, there have been three issues of developing minds over the years. So this has repeated itself for the past 30 years, really. And um, so I, I have seen over the time uh, patterns of what describes effective teaching. And basically what those patterns have, this, have boiled down to are 16 habits of mind. Now we started off with only seven and then we went to 10 and then we went to 12 and now 16. And a lot of people ask us, are that, is that all there is? And I said, no, no, there are a lot more, <laughs> but 16 are plenty. And uh, if you want some more, there's nothing stopping you from doing more. But as if you do 16 of them, and they're all interrelated, if you do 16 of them, uh, they are, that, that will be plenty. So uh, then I teamed up with Benna and Benna. Art, and could, we, could we just interrupt at that point and ask if anybody has any thoughts or questions quickly? Sure. Not necessary, what? but feel free to jump in, folks. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. I, um, at some point, did you include later on while people you had asked these uh, notable uh, scholars and educators, you know, about uh, their definitions of thinking? And then as it got through later, as you came through later in the years, were there um, I was curious if it was like, was there did you involve student feedback as well? Or was this mainly from a teacher's perspective? Not at that time mm -hmm. um, uh, in the development of this. We worked only with um, uh, with educational philosophers and psychologists, cognitive scientists, and and uh, teachers who were working with, uh, and who had published and done much research in uh, in thinking and cognitive theory. However, over time, we did test this with students repeatedly uh, throughout the grades, and we saw their responses to them, and uh, we learned an awful lot from what students had to say and what it meant to them. Uh, we also observed students using these habits of mind over time and what it meant to them uh, to be introduced to the habits of mind in the early grades 
and then followed them along through later grades. And we'll tell you that story and as part of this program, if you want to, to see the progress in the habits of mind over time. Uh, we also Harry, what from, we also did yeah, go ahead. was we uh, edited a book together called Habits of Mind Across the Curriculum, where we invited teachers to start writing about their experience with the habits and how their students were re relating and, and uh, understanding it. And we have lots of material, I mean, tons of it on our website from students, from teachers, and the voice of all of that in terms of what has it meant to them and the reflections that they have. But the actual creation of the habits of mind was actually done by Art and then Art and I together. Yeah. But then the co-creation of the development of habits of mind has been a part of our work with teachers and students all over the world. Thanks. Uh, yeah, quick question. I'm, I'm looking at the connections between uh, this work, because I think I might, this is the ASCT book as well? Yeah. Yes. I think I might have seen this one, but um, the book around like seven habits of highly effective people, oh, then right. the seven habits of highly effective teens. And then I did want to hear real briefly what you, your thoughts around all this, um, you know, uh, share, uh, I mean, uh, Angela Duckworth's worth around resilience. Because interestingly, like a lot of teachers are pushing back against this um, resilience, the over emphasis of resilience, because it, anyway, I'm curious what you got, your, your take on it. Yeah, good. So, there, there's, you're asking a couple of questions. So um, the first one you were asking was about, I forget already. Now I remember the grit one. Connection. Yeah, no, oh, to Covey. This, it was about yeah. Stephen Covey. Yeah, yeah, Covey, yeah. Yeah, it was about Covey and his habits of effective people. And he has the team, the corresponding team one, like. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. It looks like they parallel, a lot of it parallels. He, he references our work and his work, and we often do reference his and ours. Uh, one of the big differences that we can bring to your attention would be, these are the habits of mind, and notice that they're all ING words. They're all verbs, they're all behaviors. Mm -hmm. And Covey, all nouns honesty, goal setting, it's all about the nouns. So what we do is we have tried to describe this in such a way that it's actionable. It's like, these are the things that you can do if you want to show that you are honest, if you want to show that you are persevering, what is it that you do? What are the behaviors? And so ours are really more uh, trying to describe those behaviors, give you strategies, techniques, and make them actionable so that kids can actually develop them as habits. Um, whereas for Covey's work, he tends to have it be more like there are routines and processes that you do that are gonna help you. So it's complementary without any question. And then- and We did, in, uh, as, as time went on, we did include uh, Covey's work as we composed these 16 habits of mind. And then as far as Eleanor, uh, not Eleanor Duckworth, it's Angela Duckworth. Uh, as far as uh, Angela Duckworth's work with grit is concerned, um, well, I'll give you my personal opinion on it, um, <laughs> which is um, I'm afraid that it's become a little more jargony than she ever intended. And that the idea of grit doesn't really take into account whether you really care to do the work. It's just that you should persevere and do it, but it doesn't really ask, are you motivated? Does it interest you? Is this something you really wanna get good at? So it kind of doesn't focus, in my opinion, enough on something that I would call your passion for the work, your real interest in doing this and doing it. So the grit aspect that's been pulled out of her work has been the kind that sort of puts you back in the position of that you need to do this work. You need to stick with it. It's gonna help you if you stick with it, but it doesn't really talk about the nature of the work that you're being asked to stick with. So uh, that I kind of find a little troublesome. 
And I also feel that there's more to, to really doing the work and staying with it than just grit. There's a whole combination of factors that kick in and that I don't, th I think because, and it was never her intention, but I think it's just become something that's so attractive because people want students, for example, to stick with the task. However, they're not necessarily asking about the nature of the work they're asking them to stick with and what it might mean to them as individuals. I think oh. another, another part of that is that um, Duckworth doesn't really talk about when you don't need to pers persist. Um, in other words, we believe that persisting is a decision-making process. In other words, it's a metacognitive process. It's an executive function. And so you have to decide, is this a task that is worthy of my attention to it? And at sometimes it may not be. If you also uh, gather data, for example, to show uh, some contrary effects or something, you might say to yourself, you know, this isn't worth persisting about. I wanna change my mind, I wanna give it up. And so while persistence is certainly um, a healthy virtue, you also need to decide when and where and with what information you have that is worthy of persisting. And so we look upon persisting more as a metacognitive process, as a thinking process, as a decision-making process, rather than a, as an attribute that you always use or don't use. Anna, could I ask you to also mention the Coalition of Essential Schools, which we might or might not have crossed paths 30 years ago. <laughs> yes. um, but certainly, certainly habits of mind were an important part of that work as well. Yeah, yes. and Debbie, Debbie Meyer really uh, talked about them. And again, hers were done in, this, in the frame of some questions. You know, where, how, I forget, but it was like, how, when did, have I seen this before and how do I know it? Uh, looks like Brian, is that your name? No, Saran. I'm trying to figure out your name. The person who's shaking your head nicely. <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, I, me? I Karen. 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 Oh, Karen, Karen. Yeah. I mean, Karen's school still uses habits. Yeah. Um, so you, you probably know them better than I. Um, I did work with Debbie. And so I do know, and I did work with the coalition. So I'm quite familiar with all of that work. And um, I would say that those habits, again, Debbie, and when we, she has seen our work with habits of mind and she sees that, again, these are kind of behaviors that you would use as you were trying to think about why does this matter and why is it important? So which of these habits? The habits, the way we talk about them are dispositions. They're kind of a willingness to lend yourself to the activity that you're being asked to, lend your mind to it. If we went back to Ted Sizer, we would say, it's a way of using your mind well by developing habits that really develop your attitude and your disposition for doing the work. Does that make sense? It does. Um, let me just uh, throw this in the pot. Um, another issue is how we actually see that, right? And so exhibitions or por digital portfolios was a big part of the work around the coalition too. So as you talk about these habits, uh, in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking about, yeah, but you know, how do you identify it in the work? Has that, does it's that funny. Make... I was just doing a uh, curriculum work two days ago with a group of science teachers. Mm -hmm. And they had said, for example, they had said, well, one of the things that one of the habits, this sort of had a list of the habits, one of the ones that we use is thinking and communicating with clarity and precision. So I said, yeah, that, that's really a, an important one. So tell me a little bit about it. When do you ask students to actually show you evidence that they are thinking and communicating with clarity and precision? And that's something they hadn't thought about because all they were doing was labeling, labeling the habit. But when you ask the question, in a, for example, in a formative assessment where you're trying to understand, are the kids really thinking with clarity and precision, where would you have a question that would really ask them to show you evidence of that? 
And that's where it comes face to face with the content that you're teaching. Because then it's really like, in what context would I be able to, how would I show you that? Where would I show you that? How would you know that I am including it in my performance if I'm taking, if I'm doing a performance process? So it's really understanding that this, these can just be a set of labels unless they get fully integrated into the way you think and behave in the work that you do. More history or more, more direction that you'd like to take us with the slides? Well, I'll go back because we skipped and we don't like to skip anything. Okay. No, but well, no, hang, hang on with the chart just a moment, Ben, I'll go okay. back to uh, I, I um, would invite you to look at this chart and to think about your students and um, pick out one or two of the habits of mind that you see here that your students need. For example, take a look at number two, managing impulse. Do your students ever blurt out in class uh, an answer before they have really thought about it? Do your students, for example, know how to listen to understand, listen to each other with understanding and, and empathy? Do they uh, interrupt each other? Are they able to paraphrase what an, a partner is saying? Do your students, for example, think flexibly? Are they able to generate alternatives and options and look at things from a different point of view? Are your students able to think about their thinking? Do they talk about what's going on inside their head when they're solving a problem? I am analyzing, I am inferring, I am predicting, for example. In other words, take a look at this chart and think about the students that you teach and ask yourself, which of these do you see them using? And which of them do they need to use even more productively? Let's take just a moment for you to uh, examine the chart and, and think about those questions. And then we'll hear from you. I trust this group. Let's go, guys. Okay. So could, could I could I um, emphasize them like to to kind of describe a student who's doing one of these is is another is yeah, sort can, of what you said. Yeah, yeah, and I I got I got a I got a, a little case study for example, right? Cool. So we recently had uh, uh, our my freshman go to watch. Uh, the seniors present the work in progress on their uh, capstone service learning projects, or not service learning, but anyway, the senior projects. And one of my students, uh, he, he's a ninth grader. He actively engages in chat. Uh, that's how he learns. That's how he demonstrates. He shows empathy, but he also has the impulsivity of like, because he's actively in the chat doing the the, the empathy and all those, but it, at the same time, because of impulsivity, he may say something. And in fact, something was said in the middle of a presentation, the seniors took it wrong and it just like got all messed up out of, out of, out of hand. And so like, but then because of that, because of that slip up, his awesome empathy that he was showing early on is really not being acknowledged as much as like, he impulsively said something that he shouldn't have said. And he realizes he shouldn't have said it. But then when then when he's uh I won't say was attacked, but he felt like he was attacked. Now he's on he's just defensive. So he, like the situation isn't going to get resolved. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a, a case in point. Cool. Where, Let's keep him short like that. That's great. Sorry, yeah. I didn't yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I was thinking this all, almost like a bingo game. Um, so we got two done. <laughs> Anybody else want to bring up another one? <laughs> oh, sorry about that, Paul. If I went no, no, you, there's no sorry. I'm just um, encouraging everyone to keep them. Those are great. Any other case studies that anybody wants to bring up? Yeah, but I 
I want to stick with that for a moment when people get through. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, what I was suggesting is that what you've given is a very nice example of students' need for learning how to manage their impulse. And by the way, students love the vocabulary. They think it's really smart to talk about, hey, I'm managing my impulsivity. And they, they think that's, that's super. So the, the vocabulary here is very worthwhile. Um, but what you want then is for students to become aware of the fact that they have jumped to a conclusion, that they have interrupted someone, that they have uh, given an impression without data, that they have uh, made a, an inference without a, enough uh, information to base that inference. So you want them to stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me slow down here and let me think about this thinking. And here's, here are some options. Here are some other ways of interpreting it. And we love it then when students not only know the vocabulary, I'm managing my impulsivity, but they know how to control their impulse. They know how to say, well, here are three possible outcomes, or three or here are three ways of thinking about this. And you say, wow, you, you are, you've thought about it. You have considered options. You have not jumped to a conclusion. You've not made a generalization, but instead you have considered alternative. Congratulations, that's what we want. And, and that's what we want in terms of adult thinking. That's what we want for science. That's what we want for good social interaction. Um, if, if, if more people were to think that way instead of making hasty decisions, uh, the world would be a better place. And so uh, uh, focusing on one or more of these habits of mind with your students is a wonderful opportunity then for them. And by the way, you don't do all, so, all 16 of them at the same time but rather you observe your students and you see which ones they need and then you talk about it and you, you help them realize that they um, are learning to manage their impulsivity, that they have control over that, that they have metacognitive control and they can choose uh, to control their own behaviors. That's what it's about. Anybody else want to give an example? Uh, I have a, uh a student who, um, I'm looking at number 10, gathering data through all your senses. And I, I was kind of adapting it, I guess, and that is gathering data through all um, different media. Right. Um, and I was thinking of a student who, uh, we had a really intense windstorm in Salt Lake City and it uh, just knocked over these majestic old trees all over town, um, mm. like thousands of trees. And so right after it, this student went out and, and took photos of it. And then, um, then he's in my media class. And so we were talking uh, because he'd also done volunteer work at this place called Tree Utah, where they plant trees. This was before the storm. And then he wound up doing an interview where he went to a park for a tree planting and he interviewed uh, the mayor who's got a tree initiative too. And I'm thinking of the video he put together where he, I don't think he ever really thought of doing a voiceover uh, when he originally took his photos. I'm wondering, I've ne I haven't thought about, it, but I, I think he learned about it more deeply by doing maybe not all his senses, but different media. Uh, that's what I was thinking. That's a beautiful example, Chris, because it really, the, the, contribution the habits of mind could make in such a situation is for him to know that that's what he was doing. In other words, you don't have to use all senses, but you know, just think back now, what made this so rich? And to help him to notice, oh, it was because you were gathering data from all senses and communicating that so that I experienced it that way as well. Yeah, because then, you know, like he wrote text and so his story exists you know, as a multimedia on, on a website, right? So he's got text, yeah. he's got video embedded and he had photos that he put in the video. And, and I was just thinking about his voiceover too. Anyway. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's... So when he knows that he's done that, I mean, the, the power of this is when he knows that he's done that and he has a name for it, it helps him to transfer it to other situations. Like, oh, this works so well here. I wonder if this would work well in my science class when I'm trying to do or I wonder if I could do another piece that would do this again. So it's like, 
the idea of the habits is that they're not only good in the moment of what you're doing, but that they serve as a transfer to other situations as well. That's part of the learning. That sounds beautiful. Next. Thanks, Chris. Hey, Paul, it's Paul in Louisville here. Um, number 14, I think there's a tendency for teachers to think sometimes in order to be engaging, they have to be funny, you know? And, and that's hard for some of us to do. Like, we're not always, you know, like, what kind of funny are we going to be? Is it going to be urbane? Is it going to be wit? You know, how, how's this going to work today, right? And especially with uh, deeper subjects, the other day we were getting ready to read uh, in Tuesdays with Maury, which Paul has been nice enough to load up for us and now comment. Uh, we're reading the chapter where Mitch and Maury talk about death. And I knew that that was going to be heavy. So having a toolbox of uh, old videos that you can grab sometimes, I went right to Bill and Ted's, uh, the second adventure that they went on, where they actually meet Bill Sadler, who plays death, and he challenges them to games. And they, they end up playing Battleship together mm. and Twister and just a, a different way to engage with death. But in room 407, we often talk about humor as a way to uh, get people to go, ah, you know, the A-A-H-H, -H, you know, ah, right? Uh, and it's, it's the ha-ha, the H-A-H-A -H -A that leads to that ah, that then leads to the aha, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of hit them up with something that they, just uh, something dumb, like go, go grab old Carol Burnett videos or something like that, <laughs> something that's accessible um, and, and open for the classroom. We'll, we'll pull old Sesame Street stuff from the 70s to teach symbiotic relationship, you know, with the Gifo and the Gaunt picking nectarines on a planet where one can't reach them and the other can't eat them, you know. We're just trying to find something to engage number 14. I think the students respond to that well. Do you, do you find them picking up on that modeling and also doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, I think they do because uh, their attempts at humor in the classroom become more of that. Like, you know, uh, I think right now the current trend is dad jokes, and and I absolutely love them, and I love that the kids are loving them because it's bringing that banter and wit back and wordplay and that that kind of that subtle kind of uh, humor in the room that doesn't have to be necessarily a guffaw, but gets everybody kind of thinking about wait, how did that work? What, why, why was that funny just now? And we all have a new dad in the White House, right? I'm sorry. I, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I am. I, I kind of want to push people to like uh, other thoughts. I would love to talk about number fifteen. If Does it give us a straight across or not? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Okay, kind of yeah. get bingo here. Um, <laughs> thinking inter interdependently, just because I, I had a student who co-wrote an essay with another student and it went really well. Mm. And group work has been such a challenge in this setting. So I would just love to talk a little bit about 15 um, and just like the idea of collaborating and thinking and working together. It's been uh, such a struggle through distance learning. Um, and that's seems to be the thing that students are like missing the most about school is just interacting with other with their friends and classmates so if anyone has thoughts about that or um yeah I would love to hear what people are thinking because I was like I'm holding on to this one positive example after a lot of failed attempts throughout <laughs> this year one, one one thing we try to uh emphasize Anna, and this may fit for you um, is that we try to take a look at the capacities, the skills, the strategies that you use if you are thinking interdependently or uh, responding with one and on and so on. So as you think about kids working together, um, what are some of the skills? What are some of the attitudes and dispositions and thinking processes that they're going to need? For example, um, thinking interdependently means that you're going to have to listen to each other. You're going to have to be able to understand what the other person is thinking or saying or feeling. So it's taking time in a conversation to truly understand what other members of the group are suggesting or feeling. Rather than um, giving up on them or dismissing what they've said, you're going to have to learn how to paraphrase, how to make sure that everybody understands. Mm -hmm. Another uh, skill, for example, is knowing how to adopt and commit yourself to a group goal. And that means giving up your own 
personal goal or setting it aside for a moment in order to devote your energies to uh, um, achieving the goals of the group. And somehow, sometimes that's very, very difficult. You have some students who are so set on their own personal interests and so on that they're not able to set their goals aside in order to devote their energies to a group. So um, talking about this, what are some of the skills and strategies? Um, it means, for example, people working in small groups where they can see each other. So, and, and even if it's on um, uh, uh, remotely, they'll be able to see each other's facial expressions and body language so that they can interpret what other people are saying and feeling in the group. It means being able to set aside uh, your own personal interests and goals, but rather to uh, commit yourself to learn from the group and to achieve and work towards your goals. That's something that is absolutely essential in the future workplace. As you probably know, more and more uh, industries are based on uh, interdependent groups for their productivity. It means being able to create together. It means being able to think together, to produce together, to, to um, work harmoniously together, to uh, be able to understand each other and work towards each other's goals. So it's a very important and uh, timely uh, uh, disposition of the mind that kids need today, I believe. Your reactions to that? You're muted. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for uh, answering that. I think one challenge that I have when I put students in groups is that they, what you said makes a lot of sense. They turn their cameras off because they're uncomfortable, you know, with kids they don't know super well. So that listening aspect is lost. And then the group goal thing, I mean, that's a challenge even with in-person groups, um, you know, students who feel more competent are often like quickly trying to finish things independently rather than slowing their own work pace down for the greater group goal. And I don't know, I have trouble tackling that in person and I have even more trouble tackling it um, in, this, in this environment. So what you said makes sense. Um, I just don't know <laughs> exactly what the next step would be for me well, in the classroom. It's so, One thing to start is, is to talk with kids and make a list. What 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 does it mean to think independently? What would it look like, sound like, or feel like? Make that list um, and have kids um, check in occasionally. Said, well, okay, you've just had 15 minutes to do this cooperative work. Um, which of these skills did you use? Which did you find that helped you? Which uh, did you not use? Which do you need to work on? Uh, and so that kids then become conscious of those skills and deliberately employ them when they are working with a group. They've got to be aware of the skills. They've got to be aware of those strategies in order to monitor themselves and monitor the group's progress. Ben, do you want to say? Well, I, I was just going to say, Anna, that it, the, the, another thing that I have found is sometimes kids just don't feel psychologically safe. They, they feel like they're going to sound dumb. They don't really know. And they're, you know, I mean, I find often when they get the, put the black screen up, it's like, let them just hide and not participate, not, not do. So I think that there are some things that you can do to point that out, to help them to know. There's a wonderful um, uh, TED talk, Amy Edmondson. And it's, um, I could put it in the chat if I, I'm not so smart and good at that. You, we'll find you got, it. We'll yeah. Have, yeah. Okay. And and uh, she talks about what it means to be psychologically safe. And some of it is that she sort of shows you the things that go on metacognitively inside your head. Like, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to be dumb. Uh, you know, I, I want to just distract everybody because then I won't have to do this with everybody. Those kinds of things. And then she gives you the alternative, which is what do you do when you really are willing to do something and you feel safe? What makes you feel safe? And so it seems to me like that's an interesting conversation with your students, which is you can say, you know, I know a lot of people feel uncomfortable because they're not sure about it. In other words, imagine what they think 
and then say, so let's just talk for a minute. What would help you? What are some of the ways that you can feel like you can do this? And the nature of the task really matters. If they feel it's at all competitive, and they're going to be worried about, was it right? Was it wrong? So there are a lot of interesting things to just get them used to working together that are more dilemmas, the kinds of things where there is no right or wrong answer. So then it's perfect because what you're doing is you're suggesting, you know, let's get together and let's talk and let's just agree that since nobody really knows the answer to this, oh, I know a a strategy that's very good on that. If you have something like, for example, if you have a good hot topic, like um, some people say that hybrid learning was the best thing that ever happened because when you're in remote learning, you don't really have to show up. You don't have to show people. You can just work on your own and get it done. And other people say, I miss being in school so much. I wanna be with the group. I need to be with the group. What do you think about that? Where do you stand? So now you're giving them a continuum from the two extremes and asking them to take a position. Things like that are very helpful because they say to the students, anything you say will be okay. Because people say this and people say this, there's no right or wrong. So where do you stand with it? What's your thought? Those kinds of provocative things often help just to loosen them up and get them going. That's great. Thank you both so much. I feel like I have a lot of ideas now. Thank you. Great. Somebody else want to jump in with another one? This is wait time. <laughs> All right, um, what do you, shall we move on or move back or forth or? Wh- I don't know, Art, where do you wanna go? Well, um, uh, <laughs> it's up to the group. Uh, I wanna uh, abide by their interests and so on. Um, we, we might wanna talk a little bit. Most of these teachers are secondary, which is wonderful. And um, I was thinking about as you prepare students for things like careers, as students face their future uh, as young adults, uh, where do the habits of mind fit in? We might want to pursue that for a few moments. Love to hear, I, I heard what you said about secondary, but it'd be great to hear from Marina if you want to say how, or anybody else who's primary as well, you want to say how these might fit your classroom too. Yeah. Sorry to spotlight you there, Marina, but. No, no, it's okay. okay. I'm happy to, I, yeah, no, I am elementary. (laughs) I have third graders. Um, No, I see a lot of really wonderful things across the board um, that I could think of um, students who are probably and definitely in stages where they're developing these habits um, and some who probably need um, to build that awareness. I think, um, some, when I, th- I'm thinking of like number four with the thinking flexibly, um, with all of my students, uh, especially in like, um, math, um, some mm-hmm. of them are kind of like, it's really now we're doing like multiplication and we're, um, really spending a lot of time on conceptual development and, and looking at multiple strategies for solving, um, and they're like, well, I just know the answer. Why do I have to do it this way too? Or maybe that also might fit in other places too. Um, and having conversations about um, not, we're not just looking to get the answer. We're looking at like the different ways to get the answer and the different possibilities and for patterns um, and mm-hmm. to build our understanding on a deeper level. So maybe you that's also a little. Math, don't you? <laughs> I do, but I, you know, I love teaching, right? I love teaching everything. I know. Really. <laughs> I'm just noticing. Very cool. Anybody else? Did that inspire anybody else to have a thought that they want to jump in on? So I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking that um, we did promise also to introduce how I'm imagining we might be able to use these on youth voices. 
So is it, does that make sense to go there? I think so. If you don't mind, thank you. Yes, it, it um, makes sense because it gets us um, to, uh, because it's a, it, um, it gives kids an opportunity to, like you're developing metacognitive awareness of these habits by um, uh, trying to notice them in other people. So, and it's a, um, right. you're doing, it's a multi, it's a task that um, engages you socially and emotionally and cognitively. Um, and you're developing um, the language of um, persisting and managing impulsivity. The, um, the social and emotional level is you're gifting something to somebody. And it, it's, it, you're also um, making, as a teacher, you're creating conditions for people to be seen, for people's thinking and work to be visi and made visible. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Art. A couple of comments about that. Uh, I, I think you're right on when you're talking about developing the vocabulary. One of the things that we find is that one of the initial steps is to help students learn the vocabulary of the habits of mind. Now, you don't do all the habits of mind at the same time, but choose one or two that you want to work on. So for example, uh, if your students need to listen with understanding and empathy, we'll talk with them about what, what do good listeners do? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Have you ever been listened to? Have you ever had to listen to another person? What are some of the skills that you use? And what is this thing called empathy? Uh, what's the difference between just simply understanding and empathizing with another person? Have you ever been empathized with? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? So talking with students about which, what, uh, what these mean is very, very important. They need to one, uh, develop an awareness of themselves using these behaviors. They need to develop some skills in using these behaviors so that you actually practice listening and empathizing with each other in school and in, in opportunities. That you actually explore the benefits. What, how does it feel? when you listen to or when you are listened to? Uh, what, what, what are some of the benefits of that? How do other people feel when you listen to them? And why would it be important for us to all become better listeners? So that this is a skill that they wanna pursue throughout their lifetime. Now this doesn't happen overnight, but it, it is one that we suggest uh, you embark on over a period of time and that students uh, revisit them repeatedly throughout the grades and throughout the subject areas that they go to. What we really find is that it's very powerful when students, for example, learn how to listen with understanding in the science class, but then they go to social studies and the teachers talk about listening with understanding and empathy to people from different cultures or different ethnic groups, for example. Oh, and then they go to math class and they say, well, let's listen to how, how each other is solving these problems. And my goodness, I'm listening across three different content areas. And that's, a, that's an amazing discovery to them. And the more you can repeat that behavior throughout the grades and over the grades and over the subject areas, the more powerful they become. And so our intent is to have these habits of mind pervade the curriculum, pervade instruction throughout a school and what we really want is to develop a school that has the culture of these habits of mind where everybody is using them, where the uh, leadership team uh, is uh, demonstrating them. For example, uh, let's say we're gonna have a, a faculty meeting. Do all of you go to faculty meetings? Of course you do. Well, what if we started off by saying, well, let's remember, oh, oh, let, let, here's a faculty meeting uh, here's our agenda for this meeting. As we look at this agenda, which habits of mind might serve us? Well, we have to listen to each other, for example. We have to think flexibly about this problem. We have to uh, look at alternatives to this problem solving. We have to think creatively. So that the habits of mind are not something that we just do in classrooms, but rather they're something that pervade and inspire an entire school culture. 
And that's our long range goal is to create cultures of, of schools that um, incorporate, that integrate, that demonstrate, that practice, and that sustain and make commitment to get better at these habits of mind over time. And I will add to that, that we wanna have a, a website that does that also, right? So we, we want Youth Voices to build those habits of mind as well. And, and, and just to pick up one thing that Karen said about seeing, um, getting kids, like, I want to see what the, the, the example that Anna gave earlier, or the example that Chris gave earlier, or, or, or Sam. So um, let me just, some of the context of what I present, what I put together here on this page is this. Um, there's a, a history of badging. There's a history of, um, of being able to give badges to each other peer to peer. This is set up so that teachers can give individual youth, individual students, um, a, a, I call them props here, right? And feel free to push back on the language. It's easy to change some of this. But the idea is that um, you, you see something, somebody's making a really um, striving for accuracy, right? Um, and so you can click here, type here and find the kid's name um, if they're a member of Youth Voices, and then go down here and add a link to that work, right? Um, that link appears on a, a data sheet. It doesn't appear anywhere else. What happens when you then click below is that that person's um, icon shows up under striving for accuracy. So sort of um, you can kind of see, and then when they go on this page, that one is not grayed out anymore. That one becomes bold, right? They also get a quick um, email and a quick notice in their um, on their profile that hey, you got this, you you demonstrated this habit, right? So that's some of um, I purposely, by the way, did not do this. What are habits of mine? Because I hoped after this conversation you would help me write that. And we would have some sense of that. Um, that's a, a quick introduction. Any, uh, oh, so here's, compared to what we worked on in October, and, and that stuff is still here. If you go down here to load more, you can see more, some of the other stuff you we've already worked on. But we I wanted something that would be easy that, Earlier, like a teacher would have to approve these. Now any, any youth can go in and say, you know what, um, I really loved working with her in that group. Um, let me give her a thinking in, interdependently um, achievement, award, prop, recognition, right? Um, obviously, we're going to have to kind of ask them to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think once they do it a few times, they will begin to say, you know what, I really love the way Paul Hankins takes responsible risks, right? Let me go give him some, a rec some recognition for that. And the idea is that it'll be easy. It'll be quick. Um, and, you know, you can just sort of send it to them. Um, and it'll build over time. Any quick thoughts like this is terrible or this I can see potential or whatever? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I see this like ties in with some of the, uh, the habits that we're trying to uh, build in our students already and just some additional language. And uh, the other thing I see is like potential around like particular uh, lessons or activities for example the recent empathy poems that i had with students like the empathy like all the kids that that worked on that work should get empathy because and not only should they get it because they did the work but i'm hearing the language of empathy more in the classroom in in the chat and in the discussions so i'm really glad we did that work and even the kids were like super appreciative like you know even though it might have been a little bit difficult or annoying that's By the way, empathy is also a Black Lives Matter principle, right? Just that's, to one say. Their, that's one of their favorite words right now. Like I'm, I'm annoying them with too much work. Yeah. 
<laughs> but their take on empathy, which I think is interesting, has to do with understanding the context of, um, you know, allies, right? So, so you, so it's yeah, which I think is pretty clear already. Um, other quick thoughts as we're going here. Can I? Sorry. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to make a connection to these habits of mind and the badges to many, I think many schools have like, I don't know what they call them, but we have like the cult way, C-O-L-T and the acronym stands for like caring organization. I uh -huh. mean, this of course goes in a much deeper and more metacognitive and, and specific um, level about the habits of mind, but I, I see a lot of parallels with what we're trying to foster with these, with this acronym and the, the behaviors that go with it. Um, I just think that it, it could be translated, I think, or connected with the idea of badges. And I think that would be a really great idea to build, you know, school community and then kind of have a more shared understanding and recognition of um, demonstrating those behaviors. So I think it's great. Yes. A lot of people do that, Emily. They do a crosswalk between the words that they have and some habits and they just do a crosswalk on it. Huh. It, okay. it, you know, I've seen it done with character education. It's certainly done with social and emotional learning. I see people doing it with, you know, the school mission, you know, and so uh -huh. it just kind of organizes them so it doesn't feel like 16. Um, you shouldn't think just because there's numbers on the chart that there's any meaning to those numbers. <laughs> it's just like we were, we were just listing them. We never pictured them in a chart and um, it's better without the numbers. Yeah. And by the way, you're welcome to duplicate that chart and give it out to your students so that you can talk about it and put it up in the classroom and remind them. And in terms of, of badging, um, badging is a wonderful opportunity when students have demonstrated it, but also don't miss the opportunity for you to recognize when students are performing one or more of the habits of mind in the classroom. And when you say how, wow, you, you really persisted on this task in a math class, for example. Um, wow, when you were talking with Mary Ann, you had to stop and be a really good listener. Uh, you listened with understanding and empathy so that you as a parent or an adult, you recognize and comment on and bring to the awareness level uh, those habits of mind when you see them being performed. One thing I like about the youth voices, um, the, uh, the habits of mind, um, this new habits of mind page is that it invites um, the, uh, it invites the, the um, it invites one to describe this member's work that shows this habit of mind in action. So there's yeah. that box there. Um, if we can project that, that would be useful. Um, so, it, um, but for kids, um, it, in order for my kids to be able to, uh, my ninth graders to describe what they see the person doing, um, uh, I would want to, so it's the, yeah, the have the- I'm sorry, I'll go back, yeah, keep going. The um, youth voices. The, yeah. um, the, I wonder why, I wonder why, like, it seems like the like habits of mine must be, um, I can't imagine working with them well without heuristics. It, like without um, the, the questions, um, how do you know what you know? Um, what's the pattern yeah. here? Yeah. So um, not only giving them the language uh, um, to name uh, um, and so that they can think metacognitively and they can transfer the skills and own, have a sense of owner, owning that skill, but also so they can, um, so you can practice it, you need the you need a question 
to ask yourself. So that box in, um, Paul, can you project that? I'm gonna try. It was coming up slowly. Okay. The, um, the uh, mm -hmm. there we go. In the box, describe and paste links to this member's work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right there. Um, so what um, my ninth graders are gonna do is they'll paste links. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they won't describe. Um, but they will paste links. So it might, we might think about having a box where they paste a link and then another box where they describe, but there might be, um, yeah, I don't know. No. So here's the thing, here's the thing. Um, there's a balance between wanting to like attach these habits to the work yeah. and develop digital portfolios. And I want to do all that. And being able to like, you don't, you don't actually have to write anything and you could hit this and just send it to that kid. And I want that easiness too. I want the ease of being able to say, I saw, I saw her managing impulsivity um, when, when she, whatever. <laughs> um, and, and be able to send it quickly. That kind of building feels important as well. And, and and that peers can give each other these as well as teachers can give their their students these right and say and then kind of have a conversation around them um yeah so the, I mean, this... let's see how i mean let's mess around that's really what we're doing here you know so yeah go ahead. yeah those are good suggestions but let's keep thinking about it together um Art and Bennett, you've given us a great sort of framework here and the thoughts I, I just have been wonderful as well um, between, between all of the examples and thank you guys for the examples. Um, I wanna end this so we can get back to uh, other parts of our lives. I, wanna, I do wanna see if I can, um, I do wanna announce that next week and I wanna ask you to, I'm gonna give you a quick assignment. And that is, um, let's see if I can do this. So th this, these boxes with video, right? Um, there, some people have been rethinking and wondering about um, what, what else is possible. And um, there's something called Kumo space, K-U-M-O -K space, where you go into it and you, um, I was gonna show it, but I think I won't, let me just talk it. Um, so I want to meet in a Kumo space next week. Kumo mm -hmm. space is, is a, um, it's, it's, a, you get a map of a room, right? And you walk into that room and what's, what's interesting about it is that your little video can go, you can move it anywhere in the room. And if you're next to somebody, you can hear them. And if you're not next to them, you can't mm -hmm. hear them. So being able to regroup and re and say, let's go over here and have this conversation. Um, and then they're developing things you can do in it. Um, introducing that to a few teachers, there was some excitement about it. And then I realized these guys are in New York, so it made it sort of um, humanized it for me. So I contacted them. So the, the, the developers of this, of Kumo Space are gonna come and kind of introduce it to us and talk about it. And we're gonna be like educational beta users, beta users, sorry. So Max and Brett are coming next week um, and we'll meet in there and kind of mess around. What's it called, Paul? How do you spell that? Yes, um, and I'll put it in the chat. K-U-M-O space. Um, it's in there. Somebody put you it need in? need to put it in. Okay. And, and our space for TTT is gonna be Kuma space slash dot, dot com, is it? I don't know, slash. TTT space, right? So heads up warning. Um, it's a, it is a brand new sort of thing that they're working on. Um, you, you will immediately think, oh, I wish I could do this or that in there. And they, you know, they have plans around that. Um, but, and, and right now it only works on Chrome. 
So you need to come um, um, on Chrome and on a computer. Right? It's not working on other devices and so forth. The point of this again, though, is that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about how Zoom isn't working for various reasons. And I think we actually got underneath some of that tonight. Um, and so maybe another space where people can connect with each other still on video is, is a possibility to play with. I got that announcement out, sorry. <laughs> so thank you so much for this. Thank you. Um, and let's us. let's uh, meet again next week. Let's... Good luck to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. So Thank right. care, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs>